Yeah, so welcome back. I hope um, we can get those people who were not able to join to join now. So yeah, the number is I'm going up now. Okay. So I think we can um, move on now. Okay, so now we are done with the concept of elasticities, right? So the next thing I want us to do is to now discuss consumer behavior, which is the next section. So all these things. So the next session is consumer behavior. Now the interim assessment is likely to be on Friday. It's likely to be on Friday. Um, it will be confirmed through an announcement. So as I rightly told you, it is multiple choice questions that you are going to answer using Sakai, All right? So we will give you a number of them um, between, let's say between 30 to 50. We haven't decided on the number of questions we want you to answer. But we want to make sure that we remove all those avenues for teaching, uh, for cheating and all that. So we can decide to reduce the number of questions to maybe 30. And then you have 30 minutes to complete it. So you don't have that long hour. And you only have two attempts to do it. So we give you a window, maybe a one hour window. And if you start, you only spend 30 minutes on it. So if you, let's say if, if it's between 10 and 11 and you start at 10, you have 30 minutes, you go off. But assuming you are doing it and then, of course, you mentioned internet challenges and all that, and then it drops, you can go and do it again. So you are given two attempts. Or even when you have finished and then you think that your score, which we will not show you, but you think that maybe the answers you are, you want to go and do it again, you can go and have the second attempt. Now the IA will end at the concept of elasticity. So it is from the beginning up to elasticity. That is where the interim assessment will end, the multiple choice questions will end. So there won't be questions on consumer behavior. Neither would there be questions on any other thing. So it will end only at um, elasticities. So what I'll urge you to do is start getting multiple choice questions online. You can look at it online. You can look at it from textbooks, you know, anywhere, you know, and try your hands on them, right? Some, the, some of the online ones have their solutions. You know, so get multiple choice questions on these topics and then try your hands on them so that you build your confidence to before you write the exams. Now note that you'll be penalized for getting a wrong answer. So if you don't know the answer, do not answer, just skip it. If you answer and it is wrong, marks will be detected from you. We don't want guesswork with the interim assessment. So please, it's a strategy you can do. Well, those who are RICS lovers can decide to do it. And then if it comes and they have gotten the answer, they get one mark. But if you get it wrong, 0 0.25 will be deducted. So 0 0.25 will be deducted if you get it wrong. So it's up to you whether you want to take the risks or you want to be a risks averse like myself. So it's up to you to do that. 
So an announcement will be made with regard uh, with regard to that. I think I have said the IA is on Friday. So Rafi, it's on it's likely to be on Friday. And we are likely to let you have it in the morning because we believe that the internet is more stable in the mornings than during the day. So that is by way of the I so Belinda, what is not fair? Have you done any um, international exams before and all that? I don't know what, I don't understand. What do you mean by it's not fair? So we don't want you to do guesswork. So if you don't know, don't answer, leave it. And just let it take its trouble. Just walk up past you, that's all. Okay, so let's move on to, I think I saw a hand up, right? Or is it lowered? Okay, so let me allow the person to. So Ramla, um, Sir. So go ahead. Hello. You are like, we have two tries, right? Yes, you have two attempts. Can you? You would have uh -huh. attempt. And if, is it going to be like the best, is it like the best to be taken or the second one? Yeah, we will take the highest score. Oh, okay. We will take the highest score. All right, so you have two attempts and we'll take the highest score. Okay, so I think we can now move on to the concept of consumer behavior. But I've seen another hand up. Um, let me just give him that opportunity. Then I, I won't take any other person. Okay, so Joshua. Joshua, go ahead. Okay, thank you, sir. Yes. Thank you, sir. So please, I wanted to find out if the two attempts are within the one hour period we are given. Yes. It's within the period that we'll give you. So two attempts within the period given to you. Right? So for instance, if, if we give you even two hours, you have two attempts within that two hours. That's how it's going to be. Right? Right, thank you, sir. Okay. And somebody's asking whether you're all going on Sakai to go and do it. Yes, if you won't go. Now your own problem. So within the period that you are given, you are all have to be on Sakai. Some will do it earlier, some will do it anytime you want. But what we want to avoid is the cheating. So we are not going to give you too many space or too much space to do that. You have a limited time and you are supposed to answer, go and answer within that limited time. And that's why we are proposing that it's done in the morning because Sakai internet stability is excellent in the morning. Right now, we will not take it when you come and say, Oh, I started, and I, we will see all the records on Sakai. How many minutes you spent? Some will come and say, Oh, immediately I said, No, I was, I was logged out on Sakai. Yo, no problem. We'll go and check. We will see the minutes that you spent in answering the question. On the, on the attempt. If you spend 20 minutes, 30 minutes, everything will be shown. So you cannot tell me that you spent 20, 30 minutes and then Sakai logged you off. That we will not take that. We are doing everything possible to minimize cheating. Right? So please um, don't even try it because it won't help you. Yes, Patrick. 
with the time, I, I think Dawn is more favorable. Sorry? Sorry, the time, the time limit. Dawn is more favorable. Dawn is more favorable. Yeah, so that's why we are proposing the morning. Because from experience, some of the eyes that I've done on Sakai exams, in the mornings, the internet is more stable in the morning. So that's why we are proposing it, that you do it in the morning. So an announcement to the effect will be made. So I don't think you should worry yourself now. But yeah, I believe that. I also believe that the mornings are much better. Another hand up, Kingsley. Yeah, Kingsley. Is that please can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Yeah. Okay, so please, will we all go to Sakai to do with the site may jump? Kingsley, allow it to jump. Sir. You will go to Sakai and go and do it. <laughs> And I said, yes, you will all go to Sakai. So that is why we are saying that we are giving you number two attempts within a window, two hours. And if you go and you say you have 20 minutes or 30 minutes to do it, and you have a window within two hours, we cannot have all of you going at the same time. Some will start at, if assuming it is 10 to 12, for instance, Somebody will start as early at 10. Somebody will start at 10.30. Somebody will start at... But once you start, you have 30 minutes or 20 minutes to complete it. So there's not going to be any problems. So you are not spending so longer spend, time um, on Sakai when you start. You are not okay. spending longer time on it when you start. So that's so the way of you minimizing may be the class, problem. We may be having class that Friday, Friday morning. Uh, so if you're having a class, that is why um, the window is given is a window. So you, when you finish, you go and do it. It's a, the class lasts for two hours. Ah uh, well, sorry, we will see. But you don't have classes on Saturdays, right? No, or, or officially, there are no supposed to be classes on. So you are not supposed to have classes on Saturdays. So another option is I can propose to the group that we do it on a Saturday morning. That's also another option. All right, we can do it on a Saturday morning. Okay, I'm not taking any question again. Kinsley, Patrick, lower your hand. I'm not taking questions from you again. Um, oh, when I hear these things, Ramla. I said the IA is up to elastic, elasticities. Huh? I, I said it doesn't include consumer behavior. I said it here. Well, we can't do, we cannot satisfy everybody. Somebody says it's in his area, the internet is not stable in the morning, but midnight. Well, we cannot satisfy everyone. That will not even be a good policy. No one, every policy, some of them would. Some will gain, some will lose in every policy. As long as those who are gaining are more than those who are losing, we are good to go. Um, I have another person uh, Asamoah, let me just take this one. Obed. Hello, sir. Yes, Obed, go ahead. Sir, please, good morning. Obed, go ahead. Sir, I'm please, um, we heard, sir, I, I overheard someone saying that in the I, I, if you get a question wrong, it's going to be deducted from your mask. So I want to find out how to read Who said this. that? I said that here. It's not somebody saying it. I said it here. So if you're not with us, I don't know. I said it here just now, not long ago. I said that for every question you get wrong, you are going to deduct 0.25 from your mark. So it's not somebody who said it. I said it. It's coming from me. 
all right so for every question you get wrong 0.5 0 0.25 will be deducted so we don't want guesswork if you don't know the answer don't answer let it go that's what it means okay so now let's move on to consumer behavior so consumer behavior which is our next topic that we are going to do for probably our next two meetings so probably our next two meetings consumer behavior so by the end of this section or this topic these are the things that i expect you to be able to do one is for you to be able to explain important concepts such as the law of diminishing marginal utility the budget constraint um, indifference curves and also the marginal rate of substitution in addition to these i also expect that you will be able to understand and explain consumer maximization behavior as consumer utility maximization and how indifference curves can be used to represent consumers preferences and also how budget constraint represents the choice a consumer can afford so these are the learning outcomes for this section right so when we talk of consumer behavior what do we say or what do we mean or what do we do under consumer behavior so we are just trying to see how you would maximize your utility given the constraints that you have so note that we said economics is about the efficient utilization of scarce resources to satisfy your unlimited wants and needs so as a consumer you buy a number of goods and also um you no know, seek services as well right now in doing this you have your income constraint or the money that you would use to buy these goods and then the services is limited right so what we try to do under consumer choice is that we want to see how you can utilize this income to maximize your satisfaction and in this case the satisfaction is your utility so the objective for consuming an activity or consuming a particular good or a service is to maximize your utility right so think about it today you are going to buy food you buy all those things why are you buying the food why are you doing a particular activity why are you going to school why would you take a leisure it's for satisfaction right and that satisfaction in economics is referred to as a utility right so now then when it comes to the concept of consumer behavior we can distinguish between two approaches so we have the cardinalist approach and then we have the ordinalist approach Somebody is asking me to solve a question for you, Patrick. So, some of you who can solve the question for Patrick. So, this is you are saying assuming demand function for good X can be written as that. So, this is telling you that commodity X is dependent on price of the product, the price of related commodity, and then I is income, where P X is what. So, you haven't finished the question, Patrick. So if you, you, you want to find PX, the values for PY, which is the price of other commodities, should be specified for you. And then the value for I should also be specified for you. So you put in the value for I, 
you put in the value for PY, which is the price of other commodities, so that you can now solve the demand function in terms of PX. So the question is not complete. So look at the question well, and then you can, you should complete it, what the question is asking you to do. But I suspect you are being asked to find the, the demand function or PX when the values for PY and then I are specified for you. So check the question well, Patrick. Okay. So, so that, that is basically, so I was saying that in consumer theory, so there are two theories when it comes to how consumer maximizes its satisfaction or utility. And these are the cardinalist approach and then the ordinalist approach. So before we delve into each of these approaches, let's first of all look at what utility is. So I'm saying that utility refers to the satisfaction that you gain from consuming a good, right? So in any activity that you undertake, the objective is to, to what, gain satisfaction and you want to be rational and being rational is that you want to achieve the maximum satisfaction from engaging in that activity and like i said the activity can be anything it can be eating food it can be going to school it can be playing football it can be watching tv and all that so in doing all these activities your objective is to maximize your satisfaction or achieve the maximum satisfaction there is possible, right? So utility is a satisfaction you gain from consuming a good. Okay, so given this explanation of what utility is, so like I said, in the consumer's bid, to maximize its utility, there are two approaches. So the cardinalist approach and then the ordinalist approach. So we will first of all start with the cardinalist approach. Now the cardinalist main assumption is that utility that you gain from consuming a good can be measured. In other words, the individual can or is able to put value on the satisfaction that he or she gains from consuming a product, right? So for instance, this morning, some of you might have eaten gobe already. Yeah, I mean, some of you might have eaten gobe already. So under the cardinalist approach, you will be able to tell us that the gobe that you ate this morning gives you this amount of satisfaction or utility. So the cardinalist says utility can be measured and they measure it in utils. So the units for measuring utility is utils, right? So the individual can quantify or value in monetary terms the satisfaction that he or she derives from consuming a particular commodity or an activity. So that's a key assumption under the cardinalist. And it is actually this assumption that was criticized by the ordinalist, which we will look at later on. But the focus now is on the cardinalist approach. So given that utility can be measured, the, the consumer is able to tell or put value on the satisfaction that he or she gains from consuming a particular good, right? So given that, then we can distinguish between some utility concepts. So the first one is the total utility for the consumer. So the consumer does not consume just one commodity. He consumes a number of commodities. 
So if you put all the satisfactions that he gained from consuming each commodity, that total satisfaction is what we call the total utility. Or even if it is not different commodities, but the same commodities, but consumed in different units. So you have one unit. When, it, when I consume one, what is my utility? When I consume two, what is my total utility? When I consume three, what is the total utility? So total utility refers to the sum of all satisfactions gained from consuming different units of a particular commodity or an activity. That's what we mean by total utility. Take note of that. It's important concept that we will use later on. The second one is the average utility. So by now, I mean, level 200, University of Ghana students, I believe you know what an average is. So average is like the mean. So when we say average utility, then it is the utility per unit of a commodity consumed. So it is equal to your total utility divided by the quantities of a good that you consume. Right? So I can switch to the white marker to provide a better explanation on these concepts. So the total utility, for instance, if I consume one, so quantity, and then the utility. So if I consume one, I'm able to tell the amount of the utility based on the, the cardinalist approach. I can say utility is two. If I consume two, I get six. If I consume three, I get 10. So this is these are the total utilities. So the total utility for consuming two is six. The total utility for consuming three is 10. Now, average utility is a utility per unit of quantity consumed. And that is obtained as the total utility divided by the quantity consumed. So in this case, the average utility here, two over one, for the first one, which will be two. The average utility on the second one will be six over two, which will be three. The average utility for the third one will be 10 over 3, which will give you, um, I think, 3.3333, right? So that's the average utility. And then the last one or utility concept that I want us to look at is the marginal utility, MU, marginal utility. And what is this marginal utility? It is the extra utility you gain by consuming an extra unit of a commodity, right? So it's, it works in the same concept as the marginal benefit, marginal cost. So your marginal utility is the extra utility you gain by consuming an extra unit of an activity or of a commodity. So if you pick this example, for instance, that we have here, the marginal utility at a quantity of one will be the same as the total utility. So that is two. Now by adding one more quantity, the additions to your utility is four. So that is your marginal. So it means that the extra one that you added gave you four in terms of utility or four utils and then you can move on to the third one also when i added another one that also added four to my utility so that is what we call the marginal utility so it is the extra utility or the additional utility you gain from consuming an additional unit 
of the commodity. Now, in terms of formula, it is obtained as the change in total utility divided by the change in quantity. That is the marginal utility. Right? So change in total utility divided by change in quantity. That gives you the marginal utility. Right? That gives you the marginal utility. That gives you the marginal utility. Right? So I'm saying that the marginal utility is the addition, the additional utility you gain from consuming an additional unit of the commodity. And I'm using the data you have on your screen to explain that. So we have total utility here. So from the data, if you consume just one, your total utility is two. If you consume two, your total utility is six. If you consume three, your total utility is 10. Right? So if I want to find a marginal utility, I am looking for what I add to my total utility as a result of consuming an extra, an extra unit of the commodity or an additional unit of the commodity. So you can calculate that using this data. So if I consume one, my utility is three, sorry, two. If I consume one, utility is two. If I consume two, utility is six. So it means that the extra one that I consumed, the addition, the extra one, added four my total utility. So therefore, marginal utility at two is four. The same way if I move from two to three, I added one more. That one more added how many utility? It added four utils. So that is what we call marginal utility. And in terms of formula, it is what you have on your screen. So the marginal utility is change in total utility divided by a change in quantity. So you can look at this, look at this example. So if you are moving from one to two, what is the change in total utility? Changing utility changes by four and quantity also changes by one. So it will be four over one and that's what gives you four. If you are moving from six to 10, change in utility is four and then change in quantity is also one. So again, it's four over one, that's what gives you four. So that is what we mean by marginal utility. Average utility is just dividing your total utility by the quantity. So it is the utility per unit, right? Utility per unit of consumption. So if I pick the first unit of consumption. My average utility here will be my total utility divided by the quantity that I consume. And that gives me two over one. And that is two. If I come here, my total utility is six. And I consume two. So therefore, my average utility will be six over two. And that is three. And then so forth. So that is how, that's what these things are. Marginal utility, total utility, and then also average utility, right? So with this said, I can now move on, right? So somebody is asking that the first question I see here, the quantity always difference is one. No, it's not always the case. I have used that. I can use um, different quantities. I could have made this one three. 
So if this is three, the marginal utility will be change in total utility is four divided by the change in quantity, which is two. So the marginal utility would have been four over two and that will be two, right? So it's not always the case that the differences in quantity is always equal to one. I just use one to make it simple. But all you need to do is the formula. Understand that it is the change in total utility divided by the change in quantity. So whether quantity changes by one or changes by more than one, you should still get your answer. Right? Okay. Patrick, you are worrying us with this, your question. Some, some of your colleagues can even solve it for you, so. Okay, so I think this is now clear. What total utility is, what marginal utility is, and also what average utility is. So this is quite clear now. Everybody should be able to answer questions on it, particularly when you are given a table and you are asked to fill in these tables, right? So you'll be able to, quantity will be there, total utility will be given to you, and then you can ask, you could be asked to find marginal utility or average utility, or even sometimes some of them will be missing and you're asked to fill in the missing figures, right? You will be asked to fill in the missing figures. Okay, good. So let's move on. The next thing I want us to look at under this cardinalist approach is that is what we call the law of diminishing marginal utility. So there's a law when it comes to utility maximization. Um, Patrick, so hold on to the question when it's left with, when I'm about closing, I would answer that for you. So there's a law that says that utility or marginal utility diminishes as the consumer consumes to continue to consume more of a particular good. Okay, so this is, this is what the law is saying. And it's important, this law is key to the utility maximization behavior of a consumer when we are doing the cardinalist approach. So what does this law says? This law says that as a consumer consumes more of a commodity, marginal utility reduces or diminishes, right? So as you consume more of a commodity, your marginal, your marginal utility diminishes, right? And I can use this example to explain. Let's say I am very thirsty, right? And I'm going to be giving cups of water. Someone is here to quench my test, right? So I'm giving the first cup of water. When you give it to me, wow, I will enjoy it. So at that level, the satisfaction is higher because I'm very thirsty and you're giving me the first cup of water. Satisfaction there is high. I will enjoy it. Now, when you give me the second cup of water, I say, oh, okay, I'm not okay, give me more. When you give me the second cup of water, if you are going to be honest with yourself, the second cup of water will not be as enjoyable as the first cup of water. and then continue to give me the third cup of water. The third cup of water will not be as enjoyable as the second cup of water. And this will continue. It will get to a point that when you give me a cup of water, I might even vomit because I'm not enjoying it anymore. 
I'm not gaining any satisfaction from it. If you give it to me, I'll vomit. That is the concept of diminishing marginal utility. And that's what the law says. And it is true for almost all activities that we do. When you continue to do the same thing, you know, enjoy it, and you continue to, um, what do you call it? Consume a particular activity. The extra benefits gained from an extra unit of the activity decreases or declines. And that is what we call the law of diminishing marginal utility. Right? Now, as a, as a result of this law, as a result of this law, if you draw the total utility curve, so I have my total utility here, and then I have my quantity here. If you draw the total utility curve, you see utility rising as you continue to consume more of the item or the good, it will hit a maximum and then it will start falling. And then if you draw the marginal utility curve, you see that the marginal utility curve, marginal utility will start decreasing. So marginal utility will start decreasing as you consume more of the commodity. It will be a point, there will be a point that it will be zero. Yeah, yeah. There will be a point that marginal utility will be zero. And at that point, your total utility has reached a maximum. So at the point where marginal utility is zero, so at the point where MU is equal to zero, your total utility is at the maximum. Is at the maximum at that point. Right? And therefore, you find your total utility, your marginal utility is zero. So from there, any increase in quantity will result in marginal utility being negative. That is when you start vomiting, right? So even if with food, as you continue to eat the food, when you are very hungry, oh, you enjoy the extra, 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 extra. You get to a point now, the extra, it cannot go anymore. As you put in, it will come out. That is when utility has, I mean, the, the negative has set in. Marginal utility has turned into negative. So the satisfaction there start reducing, right? So that is what the law of diminishing marginal utility does to total utility. So because of the law, at lower levels of quantity, total utility rises. So although marginal utility is decreasing, but what you are adding to total utility is positive. So your total utility increases. It will continue to do that. It will hit a maximum where total utility does not increase anymore, but total utility starts decreasing. When it starts decreasing, it means that your marginal utility has gone into negative. That is why your total utility is decreasing. Right? That's why your total utility is decreasing. So based on this law of diminishing marginal utility, it means that if you're a consumer and you want to consume more, if you consume more of an activity, your marginal utility will come down if you're a consumer. And if you consume less, your marginal utility will increase. So please get these two points. With the law of diminishing marginal utility, the more you consume, an activity, the lower your marginal utility becomes. And then the less you consume an activity, the bigger your marginal utility becomes. So it is an important point that I want you to note down. Okay. Now, before I continue, I've seen some three messages and some two hands up. 
let me go and check well somebody is asking whether the law of marginal utility applies to money well so money okay so this is this is what you would i, I don't want to go too deep into economics but money if it is if not for what money can buy money is nothing it's just a paper hmm? roger if not for what it can buy it's just a paper so always think in terms of the intrinsic value of the money what you can use it for right so even if you give me plenty money what i can use it for either consumption to buy a car to do whatever i can use it for that the law of diminishing marginal return sets in there right so please the paper is nothing if not for what it can buy or what is useful so look at it that in that sense so there's also another, this means that more you consume the less satisfaction you gain so the due to the law so the more you are consuming the thing you become tired of it it's less satisfaction yes so it will get to a point that your total utility will hit will get to the maximum and then as you continue to consume more your total utility diminishes right your total utility diminishes okay so that that is the law there and it's it works i mean sometimes i always use this law to explain why some students when they go to the library the first one hour or two they are very productive or even when i'm teaching the first one hour when it's face to face you see that student pay attention for the first one hour but subsequently you see they start fidgeting with their phones and know that the law of diminishing and um, utility or returns are set in that's where because you see they have taken 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 now the brains can't take anymore some people have of course have um, sharper brains and all that but some people they get tired that's that's that that is some way to explain the diminishing marginal utility concepts right so the satisfaction you are gaining from being in class from the early stats or early part of the lecture, it is so huge. It's so nice for you. You are fresh. You get it. But as it, things become complicated, you say, oh, things are becoming complicated. No, it's because you see the diminishing returns is setting in at that point. Right? So that, that is what this law is all about. Okay. So given this law of diminishing marginal utility and even the shape of the total utility and then the marginal utility. So what do you see? You see that the marginal utility curve is downward sloping, indicating that as you consume more of a commodity, your marginal utility comes down, right? Marginal utility comes down as you consume more. Okay. So given this, the question is, what determines or let me put it this way at what quantity should a consumer stop consuming an item given that total utility will start falling at some point so at what quantity should a consumer stop consuming an item in other words what is the optimal level of consumption that's the question asked. At what point should I stop consuming an item? And to answer this question, I am going to look at it in two scenarios. One is the case where the consumer consumes just a single good, one commodity. So I have the one commodity case. The one good case. And then the second one will be more than one. So I'll look at the two commodity. So two goods case, right? 
So let's look at the one good case. Now remember, in our, one of our earlier classes, we said that for economists, we make decisions at the margin. If you remember, we make decisions at the margin. And what that meant or what that means is that for every decision that you are making, deciding on quantities, then take the decision up to the point where the marginal benefit is equal to the marginal cost. If you remember, we mentioned this, where marginal benefit is equal to marginal cost, right? Where marginal benefit is equal to marginal cost. So the same concept is applied here. So here, the consumption is an activity. So you have to take the decision at the margin. So you have to consume the activity, you know, the activity up to the point where the marginal benefit of that activity is equal to the marginal cost. Where the marginal benefit of the activity is equal to the marginal cost. So here, what is the marginal benefit in terms of consumption? The marginal benefit is the marginal utility in terms of consumption. The marginal benefit, let me clean this. So in terms of consumption, so the marginal benefit should be equal to the marginal cost. Now, the, in terms of consumption activity, the marginal benefit is the marginal utility. That's the marginal benefit. So that is the benefit, the additional benefit you get from consuming a good is the additional satisfaction. And that is what we call the marginal benefit. And that is the marginal utility. Right? And then what is the marginal cost? The marginal cost is the price you pay. Notice that the price is fixed. So you pay a fixed price for the quantities of the items that you buy. So if I buy one and the price is 10, I pay 10. If I buy one extra, I still pay 10 for that extra. If I buy another extra, I pay 10 for it. So we assume that the marginal cost is a price and then the marginal benefit is a marginal utility. So this shows that the consumer should consume quantities up to the point where the marginal benefit of consumption, which is the marginal utility. So continue to consume up to the point where marginal utility of the commodity is equal to the price of the commodity. So let's assume the commodity is commodity X and then the price for commodity X. Now this condition is what we call the consumer maximization equilibrium condition. So this is the consumer, so this is the consumer equilibrium condition. Consumer equilibrium equilibrium condition. Right? For one commodity case or one good case, the consumer should maximize or consumer should consume commodity up to the point where the marginal utility of that commodity is equal to the price of that commodity. If you get there, then you stop. Don't go more. If you go more, if you consume more, your utility will be negative. In fact, there's diminishing. So there's no point in consuming more and don't consume less. If you consume less, you will not be efficient because if you consume more, you gain more satisfaction, right? So therefore, you only stop at the point where the marginal utility of the commodity is equal to the price of the item. So this is a consumer equilibrium condition. Now we can use this condition to draw 
or to show why the demand curve is downward sloping. We can use this to show why the demand curve is downward sloping. But before we do that, let's see. In case marginal utility, assuming marginal utility is greater than price, assuming marginal utility is greater than price, what should the consumer do to make marginal utility be equal to price? The consumer has no control over price. You cannot change price. Take note of that. The consumer cannot change price. But marginal utility is greater than price. So what should the consumer do to make these two equal? Raise your hand up if you can answer it. Right, raise your hand up if you can answer it. So I have some hands up. I have Kinsley, I have Godfred, I have Mashud. I'm in there. Okay, so let me go to Kinsley. Kinsley. Sir, please, mine is actually a question on the, the graph, the marginal utility graph. So I don't know if we'll finish with this question and we'll talk Your, about Yours is a question on the marginal utility graph. I've yes, passed that, yes. but I've deleted that. Okay, so let me get somebody who can answer this. So, um, Godfrey. Godfrey. Godfrey, go ahead. Hello, sir. Yes, Godfrey, go ahead. Okay, so it means that you must you must cause the marginal utility which is greater to also fall sorry you must cause the marginal utility which is greater to also fall so marginal utility is greater than price you must cause the marginal utility to do what i can't hear you. your voice is very low you you must cause the marginal utility which is greater to also fall uh -huh. so how do you make it fall Okay, so for marginal utility to also fall, you must consume more of the product according to the law of diminishing Brilliant. marginal utility. Brilliant. That is the answer. This is great. This is brilliant. So due to the law of diminishing marginal utility, if I want to cause marginal utility to fall here, then I have to consume more of the commodity. Right? So more of the commodity has to be consumed so that marginal utility will fall, so that its equivalent will now be equal to price. The same way, if marginal utility is less than price, then the same way, you need to get marginal utility to rise. And the only way you can get marginal utility to rise due to the law of diminishing marginal utility is to consume less of the commodity, marginal utility will rise due to the law of diminishing marginal utility. So with this concept, brilliant, we can now use this to draw the demand curve. So let's see. So let's say we have an initial equilibrium where our marginal utility of X is equal to the, marginal, uh, the price of X. And this actually corresponds to a particular quantity. So this will be an equilibrium quantity. So let's say that equilibrium quantity is here. So this is P1 of X. So we are looking at it in the price of X and quantity of X quadrant. And this, this um, equilibrium here correspond to this X1. So it gives us one point in the demand or in the price and quantity quadrant. So now let's assume that the price of X falls to X2. So something happens and the price of X has fallen to X2. So it means that now marginal utility of X will be greater than the price of 
x, which is x uh, p2 as a result of that. So the consumer has to ensure that this is equal again. And how does it happen? He has to consume more of the commodity to bring marginal utility down. He has no control over price. So by consuming more, it means that at the price of P2, the consumer will consume more of X at that price. So I'll call this one X2. Right? So if you draw a line to pass this through point, this is what gives us the demand curve of commodity X. So initially we said demand curve is downward sloping without going into why it is downward sloping. Right? We just assume that it's downward sloping, but why was it downward sloping? The law says that as price increases, quantity demanded will fall and vice versa. How? Now this is what explains that law based on this consumer behavior theory. So we clearly see that the reason why demand is downward sloping is that the consumer takes decision at the margin. And that equilibrium condition is that the marginal utility of X should be equal to the price of X. So if you vary the price of X, then the consumer has to vary its marginal utility by either consuming more or less of the commodity. And this is what explains the, the demand curve. Okay, so this is a one commodity case. Now let's quickly look at the two commodity case, then I can come and answer Patrick's question for him. So one commodity case is this, the, in the two commodity case, the equilibrium condition is that marginal utility per dollar or per CD for each of the commodity. So is the marginal utility of X over price of X should be equal to the marginal utility of Y over the price of Y. So we are assuming that the two commodities are Y and X. So if you have more than one commodity, this is the equilibrium condition. So in other words, you can simplify this to be marginal utility of X over the marginal utility of Y is equal to the price of X over the price of Y. This can also be the case. And the same way you can use this to also draw the demand curve for each of the commodities. This is something that you are supposed to do on your own. In fact, in the lecture slides, you are supposed to do it on your own, but I've even done the case for one commodity for you. So go and do the case for the two commodities. Vary price and see how the consumer will react using the law of diminishing marginal utility to explain that. Okay. So now I have nine minutes. Let me quickly look at Patrick's question. So Patrick is a, a demand function question. So you have a demand function that is, um, so you have QD is equal to 80 minus 3px. So px is the price of x and then plus 2p y and then plus 10 i so this is a demand function so the px is the price of x and then the py is the price of a related commodity and i is a consumer income so according to the equation a rise in price of y would cause the demand curve for x to decrease Yes, and that is true, Patrick. So a rise, because is, this is positive, because this is positive, the, there is a positive, so Y and X are substitutes because of the positive sign here. So please note, this is a general demand function. Let me put it way. 
So this demand function here is a general demand function that has price, price of related commodities and income in the same function, right? It has price and then price of related commodity and then income in the same function. So you can use it to answer questions. So now if you, you can use this to tell the relationship between X and then Y by looking at this positive sign here, as long as this sign is positive, then it means that Y and X are substitutes. Therefore, an increase in the price of X, sorry, in the price of Y will lead to a reduction in the demand for X. X and Y are not complement. Also, is a multiple choice question. Okay, I see what you mean. So A, so X and Y are not complement. X is not an inferior. As long as this positive sign here, there's a positive sign in front of the coefficient of income. X is not an inferior good. So this positive here is telling you that an increase in income will increase X. Therefore, X is a normal good. And then the other one, X and Y are substitute. So yes, so X and Y are substitute. And then the request a rise in the price of Y will lead, would cause the demand for X to decrease. So the answers A and D are correct. Patrick, maybe you want to check the answers well, but A is correct. A rise in the price of Y would cause the demand for X to decrease because they are substitute. Oh, sorry, 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 sorry. A is not correct, sorry. If they are substitute, it will rather cause the demand for X to increase. Sorry, Patrick. So the right answer is D. So a rise in the price of Y will cause the demand for X to increase because X and Y are substitute. So that is not correct. So the right answer is D, X and Y are substitutes. Patrick. I hope that answers your question. Okay, so X and Y are substitutes. Please, for those those who want to do their their concern and gossip about hungry and all, send those messages privately. We don't want to be reading those messages. If it is not a message about a question, don't post it to me or to the entire group. Eh? I'll start naming and shaming people who put funny stuff on the chat. You know, it distracts me. When there's a message in the chat, I think somebody has asked a question. So I want to go and, and then answer the question. But if I go and open it, it's all, it's all about I'm hungry and all that. I will not take it. I will name and shame the person. So use a chat dialogue for only questions, comments, and suggestions relating to what we are doing not any other thing because it distracts me when i see the question chat i want to go and check thinking that somebody has a question and then i go and open and it's about time is not going and then you are not eating and then you are not doing all that huh okay so let me go over patrick's question again this is it so the question is, so you have a quantity demand for X is equal to 80 minus 2PX, I think, and then plus 2PY. And then, of course, plus 10I, right? Now, this is a general demand function. So if you look at the demand functions that we look, we looked at it only in terms, so it would have just, it would have been only this, right? So, but this is a demand function that now includes 
Y, that is the price of an, a related commodity, and also income. So this is showing that this demand function is dependent on price, it's dependent on income, and then price of a related commodity. So a question was posed. So if you look at this, the positive sign you see here in place of the price of Y indicate or shows that X commodity X and Y are substitute because an increase in the price of Y will lead to an increase in the quantity demanded for X. The positive sign you also see here shows that commodity X is a normal good because this positive sign is showing that when income increases, X was also increased. So X is a normal good, right? But not an inferior good. Okay. And then those are the So if you look at this, then the right answer for the multiple choice will be that X and Y are substitutes. Okay. Any question? So any question before I end the class? Okay, so I cannot be answering all multiple choice questions for me for you here. Let's go, Patrick. I cannot be answering all that for you. You should go and now I've given you a, a head start. So use that to answer the rest of the question. All right. So you are saying that assume the demand function for is, can be written. So it's the same demand. Why P is a if the price of Y decreases by $5, what would the reduction in PS have to be in order to keep the quantity demanded of X on change by the change in the price of Y? So just do it. You can just do your permutations. Hmm? Patrick. You can do it. I will not do this thing for you. Okay. All right. So I think it's time is 12. And some of you might have other lectures and know that I also have a presentation to attend. So I need to, I'm ending the class here. I will make available all the recordings to the class trip. I think I've done up to lecture five. So you should have six. Really, I'm done with this class. Okay, so enjoy the rest of the day. Uh, we have of definitely we have our um our I think the la the last class for this week before you write the interim assessment. So I'll definitely see you again. I'll meet you online again. So have a good day and then enjoy the rest of the day. Bye-bye.